Hey, uh, to everyone's attention, uh, I want to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Keith Skinner. He is an MD, PhD. He graduated from uh, West Virginia University. Uh, he specializes in uh, radiation oncology, and he also, um, uh, even though he has a background in, um, let's see, microbiology, immunology, and biology, uh, a lot of what he works with is he has to do with uh, cancer therapy and particularly doing uh, radiation physics related work. Um, he's currently assistant professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology uh, and, uh, at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. And uh, he also has about uh, 50 plus peer reviewed publications uh, on, on the topic. So with that, I want to talk over to Dr. Skinner. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to come and talk with you. I'm really excited to talk to, talk to you tonight because um, most of the time when I'm giving talks, I'm giving talks primarily to either physicians or biomedical scientists. So I would be really curious to see what you guys' thoughts are about both the field, which I'm going to give you an overview of, and then specifically what drugs, what biologic modifiers that we can give uh, to either protect normal tissues from ionizing radiation or conversely, sensitize tumor tissues to ionizing radiation. So <clears throat> questions to answer today, in my opinion. Number one, what is radiation oncology? That's my field, but I want to give you kind of a flavor of what I do in the course of my day, and hopefully I'll make it at least a little bit interesting. And secondarily, how can we utilize the physical characteristics of therapeutic, therapeutic radiation to decrease toxicity? Specifically, we have a variety of different weapons that are armamentarian as radiation oncologists, as people that use radiation therapeutically to treat primarily cancer, but there are a few benign diseases that we treat as well. How can we use different forms of ionizing radiation to accomplish that, depending upon the clinical scenario? Next, what are the current clinically used biologic modifiers of radio response, i.e., you know, what can we use? What can I give you either as a pill or as an injection to make your body respond differently to radiation or conversely to make your tumor respond differently to radiation? And finally, those are what, what currently is available is actually quite minimal, to be perfectly honest with you. There's only one FDA-approved radiation sensitizer and only one FDA-approved radiation protector. Uh, but what new drugs are on the horizon? What new things are coming up? So that's kind of where I'd like to begin. So first, radiation oncology, what is it? So it is, at its most basic sense, the application of radiation, particularly ionizing radiation, to treat malignancy. In just terms, and I've kind of capitalized some terms throughout this talk to, to kind of get us on the same page in regards to definitions. So teletherapy, or external beam radiation. That's radiation, a source of radiation that comes from a machine outside the body that is shot at high intensity to some place within the body. Teletherapy, external beam radiation. Actually beginning them to be used a year after Rankin discovered it. So, just imagine that. You discovered this new thing, this new x-ray, this new thing, and within a year people are like, okay, let's shoot these people and see what happens. And that's exactly what this exactly is. What and just as a side note to that, um, in the initial application of radiation and radiology, you know, actually it's plain stuff, so you break your leg, out of your So in the initial application of that, the physicians and the scientists that were doing it, they would calibrate their machines to skin their What does that mean? That means they put their hand in front of the source, and they would modulate the energy output of their machine until they saw redness of their skin. <laughs> As you can imagine, a doctor, as you can imagine, a job hazard for an early radiologist was actually in graduation. Because they would be self-educated, because they would be overdosing themselves with X-ray. So that kind of lets you know where we started. And this is the you know the turn of the century, 1900. Now, when it came out, everyone wanted to use these magic X-rays to do something. Right? So what they did. And it actually works very well for that. Unfortunately, it also very works very well in reducing skin cancers. People use it to get rid of unseemly hair, bitter with skin cancer. Uh, people use it for tuberculosis, interestingly enough. 
And you can imagine how desperate you have to be to get someone that's sorry, and shoot at somebody's mind to try to get an infectious disease, but they did it. And actually, that's what that picture is. That is a picture of an early teletherapy unit being used to treat tuberculosis. Who the fuck knew what we were doing? This is zero. But that's where we started. So, what was the statistic on all those kids 70 years ago that put their feet in if they could see if the shoes fit? So the statistic, well, that's a little, it was a little difficult to follow that up. And I know what you're talking about, because you're, they were doing the shoe size. I did. Yeah, it was a novelty thing, right? You know, you could use an extra to size your shoe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> isn't it crazy, right? Yeah. Like, that's really crazy. Yeah. How do we do that? Longitudinally, that's a little difficult to pick up. Okay. Wow. But what I can say is that generally for these childhood exposures, the risks of skin cancer are high, generally. And also, um, like for example, fiber. The risk of thyroid malignancy is actually higher for these kids that have kids that actually have their tonsils and their adenoids irradiated. Because back in the day, mm, 30s, 40s, as opposed to, oh, you don't want to have that, that, that bloody tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy surgery, they should have radiation. They'll shrink it down, it will, because the lymphoid tissue is a very low radiation, which they can down quite lengthily. But then you've got that risk of thyroid malignancy a few decades down the line. So unfortunately, a lot of people were hurt by this initial application of radiation. Now, but it got even better, and I'll tell you how it got better. Because people, wow, we've got radiation. We've got an actual radioactive source that we can use. So much the better, right? So it progressed. We initially have these low intensity, uh, low penetrance x-rays, but now it's just radiant. So what happened? So people put radium in all kinds of stuff. They put it in water, um, up in the lower, <laughs> Okay. It, it, it's actually, uh, I think it's from the uh, that this is radium-infused water, and it's like it. It's a feel good. This American, like, lives to the very Seriously. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. And then the crazy news. The crazy news is serious. And this is just one example of medicine. You can talk about the advertisement even from the 40s and 50s, saying, what looks like you have smoke. You know. mm -hmm. The same thing. But anyway, so left-hand column of uh, playing to the people's needs to be younger, to be healthy, and whatever fashion that was. But it was actually quite tragic. Um, on the upper right hand is a picture of a newspaper article from the 50s. And it isn't quite related to radiothor, which is what that water was called, but it was related to a group of women who were actually seeking radium watch eyes and watch eyes. It's in the dark. Amazing, right? But the problem was that it actually lit, lit that brush with the tongue. And it was taking that radium for a while. And the radium accumulated in the bones. And the jaw started off. Because of the radioactivity. It accumulated primarily in the jaw. Some other places, like the primarily in the jaw. And you can see a picture of a young man in the lower left hand column. He was a wealthy socialite, um, whose name I'm blanking on right now, but a wealthy socialite. But his doctor, he wanted to see his doctor, he was going to have some teeth. Take some of the radio. Okay. Tell us over his course of seven years. And that's what happened to his jaw. That was only one. And after a while, again, it progressed. And of course, I don't want, I didn't want to, I didn't want to show you some of the more graphic pictures. These are quite graphic pictures. Things that happened to these young women at this gym. And it's many other things that have Um, So, with some trepidation, the field progressed. So by the late 20s, um, we saw dramatic toxicity, as I was kind of alluding to there. Uh, the question is why? Or more importantly, the question is can we actually use it relatively safely? And this led to the concept of fractionation. And this was developed by a Frenchman, Henri Picard, who practiced at what uh, eventually became the Institute of Social Policy in Paris. So I won't start off at the phone for Jackson, but it's a bit different. But um, a practice there, and uh, what he did is he started, as opposed to delivering one very high dose of radiation, what he did was to deliver lower doses of ionizing radiation over periods of time, and it wound up being daily, to get a cumulative dose. And why is this important? Well, we had no idea at the time, but why it's important is that tumor tissue versus normal tissue, they're composed of cells. That's most basic level. 
Tumor cells have a reduced capacity to fix the DNA damage that is associated with ionizing radiation. Normal tissue, normal cells, have a much higher capacity to accomplish that, to fix the DNA damage associated with radiation. So, if you get a little bit per day, what you do is you induce DNA damage in both types. Normal cell can repair that over the span of, say, 24 hours. The tumor tissue isn't quite as good at it. So it's like a horse switch, right? You've got your tumor cell and the normal cell. And every time you get treated, they both get pushed back. But the normal cell repairs it and the tumor doesn't. And you do the same thing again. Nobody gets pushed back. The normal cell repairs the tumor cell. What you're doing is trying to take advantage of an inherent difference between a tumor cell and a normal cell. That is the concept of fractionation. So that's one. That was one of the key concepts that took radiation from a novel to dangerous novel to something that could actually be used to treat people effectively. The second, um, at least with radium, is the concept of short-term brachy therapy. That's Greek. Um, basically, and, and uh, actually, I'm blanking on what brachy means, but what it really means is you take your radioactive source, you take your radium, and you plant it in the area that you want to do either in a body cavity, and I'll show some pictures later on, and either in a body cavity or within the tumor directly itself. You let it sit for a period of time. It delivers some amount of dose, some amount of radiation, ionizing radiation, and then you take it out. That's the important part. Because otherwise, you're going to have this horrible um, uptake, or excuse me, horrible toxicity, or if you just ingest radiation or ingest or source, we have horrible toxicity when you invariably incorporate them in the Now, as a side note to that, what I will say is that in modern era, people are actually taking advantage of this bone trophism. Trophism means goes to the So, in patients that have metastatic cancers in bone, for example, there are several different types of treatment, spontaneous in the speech radiation, or spontaneous in the that are actually given. Um, it's strontium tags to something that will localize it to the tumor tissue within bone to actually treat those, to treat those bone mutations. But that's, that's more advanced than we're at right now. Right now, we're just, we're in the 1920s. So we've moved forward a little bit. Not dramatically, but a little bit. We've got fractionation, we've got breakthrough therapy, we've got teletherapy, that picture that I just showed you. Um, so, teletherapy, or external beam radiotherapy, is kind of a workhorse of my field. Right? Radiation that goes from the machine outside the body to the area that we want to treat, which are primarily solid tumors. The cancer world is divided into liquid tumors and solid tumors, all right? Liquid tumors are blood cancers, things like leukemia if you've heard of that. Solid tumors are just about everything, or sorry, leukemia and myelin. Solid tumors are just about everything else. So, and when we think about cancer with the exception, again, leukemias and myelomas, we're talking about solid tumors. And that solid tumor world is where we come in. And we wind up treating, as radiation oncologists, 60 to 70 percent of all solid tumors. So, of all the solid tumors, we treat 70% of them. That time, a significant portion you probably did not even know that radiation oncology existed in the field until tonight. Maybe not, but I'm going to go down that path. So, external beam radiation. So, firstly, what were we limited by? We were limited to superficial malignancies because we didn't have the energy to penetrate deep at that time. So, what could we do? We could treat skin cancers, right? Very superficial. We can treat them as your cancers. You put your finger right here, you get a little prominent, it goes up and down and you follow. That's the lamp or angel part. Smoking causes a cancer in that area. And because you can feel how close it is to the skin, various cancers are one of the first cancers to be treated with radiation. Actually, really straightforward to do. One beam coming from this way, one beam coming from this way. Make sure you don't overdose the spinal cord and you got it. So it was one of the first cancers to be treated and be treated successfully um, with radiation. However, um, that pro uh, teletherapy progressed. It progressed to the cobalt unit. The cobalt unit was a major leap forward in regards to radiation therapy. With the cobalt unit, for the first time, you could actually treat malignancies that were more than superficial. They were deeper in the body because you could penetrate deeply. You had an energy that could accomplish that. Not great, <coughs> but it could do more than what we had prior to. And in fact, the development of the cobalt unit, a lot of it, happened here in this town, particularly in James and Prince. But anyway, then, moving forward beyond that is the linear accelerator. What is a linear accelerator? 
how you can modulate what you're shooting. Right? You can, we use six, well, what we call six MV beams, which are actually six MV electrons that are shot in the constant type. We use six, we use 18s, we use F11. Those are the three beam energies that we typically use. And then, even moving beyond that, it's great. But now what we can do is we can put you in a machine, not like this guy here, he's just kind of saying that. What we can do is we can put you in a machine, we can put you in a mold. We can make a mold around the bottom. Like you, with a millimeter of accuracy. We can take x-rays to make sure that you're in exactly the right position. We can take a CAT scan utilizing a linear accelerator. Actually, you don't have a linear accelerator and moves around the bottom here. So. We can create a comb, what's called combing the CAT scan to actually make sure your body's in the exact right position. So we moved far beyond this guy. We moved to cobalt, like I said. It was at least partially developed at MD Anderson. And now, look at this fancy piece of technology. That thing costs a few million dollars. But what it can do is it can treat. The radiation emerges from the head here. It can also, if you see here, this is the, uh, the KV imaging apparatus. And it can actually rotate all the way around 360 degrees to generate the Columbian CT that I was talking So, teletherapy. Conventionally fractionated external beam radiation. Let's break that down. Conventionally fractionated, that means approximately 1.8 to 2.2 gray per second. That's what conventionally fractionated means. Now, we're talking about the concept of fractionation. Low dose per day, multiple days, and it's added time. It's the most common form of radiation. It's the only form of radiation that you can give concurrently with chemotherapy. I'll go into that a little bit later on. The only form of radiation that you can do that with safety. You can use it to treat large volumes. This is the this is the workhorse of what we do. Head neck cancer, that's what we do. Lung cancer, unless it's very, very early stage, that's what we do. Sorry, um, the microphone there is uh, not the kicking up. Not the other one. Uh, so you need to stay somewhere near that. This one? Okay. How about I move a little bit? Okay. I'm sorry. I'm just to walk a little bit. Um, so it treats large volumes. Um, the vast majority of cancers that we treat with radiation are treated this way. There are a few exceptions, and I'll talk about them in a few minutes. But we use all kinds of different beams. We're only talking about using the physical characteristics of beams to try to accomplish different things. That's what we're going to talk about right now. So there are a lot of different ways to do it. The workhorse is the photon. The workhorse is the photon, typically from a linear accelerator or a linear, which you know what it is now because we just talked about it shooting electrons, accelerating them into a tungsten target, generating photons, and that's what you're treated with. Um, how do we plan it? Well, it's kind of cool, and I'll show you some images in a few minutes. But what we do is we actually generate a CAT scan. We use a CAT scan. And I draw, you, you guys remember Microsoft Paint, right? You guys probably use much more advanced computer programs than that, but you remember Microsoft Paint. So I use what amounts to a glorified Microsoft Paint to draw on a CAT scan. And I say, okay, here's a tumor, and here's a lymph node. And here's something I want to avoid, spinal cord and software. Data. And I do all those things. And then we utilize a specialized person called a dissymmetrist who takes those things that I have contoured, what we call them, contoured, drawn, and tries to generate a best class solution. So and so many radiation bees each have its own little intensity modulation to treat what I want to treat and avoid what I want to avoid. And that's called intensity modulated radiation. So imagine, I'm the tumor. I can have a radiation beam coming from here. It's like the spokes of a bicycle here. And the tumor is at the hull. A radiation beam coming here, radiation beam coming here, radiation beam coming here, radiation beam coming here. All relatively low intensity. But when they come together and they intersect at the tumor, they're at high intensity. Moreover, if I were to turn that beam on its edge and it was shooting right in my face, which I don't want, I don't recommend, um, what you can also do to that beam, let's say it looks like a square, 
You can also make, let's say, this portion of the beam is very strong, highly intense. This part of it, highly energetic. And this is successful in other cases. Highly energetic. So, highly energetic, less energetic, more energetic. Throughout the course, even of one beam. So, you throw all this into a computer algorithm, and out comes a best class solution that will utilize multiple different beams coming from multiple different angles to treat what you want to treat and avoid what you want to avoid. That is intensely modulated radio therapy. Um, and typically, again, delivered with photons. Sometimes we use electrons, and we'll talk about why uh, electrons can be advantageous in just a minute or two. We use protons. Uh, we actually have a proton facility here um, in Houston. There are uh, seven or eight in the country. It's not that many of them. It's used less commonly, primarily because they're cost. Ooh, it's expensive. To put in the proton center here in, in Houston, now this was quite some time ago, it was about six, cost about 100 million bucks to do that. Um, newer proton facilities are a little less expensive, as with any new technology. The, the further you get along, uh, the cheaper it becomes, but they're still quite expensive. The last three, carbon ion, neutrons, and helium ion, are very, 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 very uncommonly used. Secondary cost, secondary lack of experience, there's like one or two carbon ions, actually it's two, carbon ion facilities in the world uh, that treat patients. One is in China, um, and others in Germany. Um, neutrons were popular, they were popular in the U.S., and uh, there's one facility that's still doing it. Um, the problem is there's a lot of toxicity associated with neutron radiotherapy because we don't know exactly what the dose is doing biologically. So not very many people use it. And helium ion, I don't think anyone is using that at present. So before we talk about the different beam characteristics, I want to go over the concept of relative biologic effectiveness. What does that mean? It basically says you've got all this, remember, you've got all those different beams, the proton beam the photon beam, the electron, whatever, uh, 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 neutrons, carbon ion, whatever. Um, it quantitates the different absorbed dose required by different forms of radiation to achieve a similar biologic endpoint. So basically, if I took a proton beam and a photon beam and shot it at your skin, I want to see the same level of redness for both of them. Whatever dose that is, because the same level of redness for both of them is the relative biologic equivalent. Okay? So for protons, um, and, can, and it varies with different tissues. Skin's different than brains, different than gut. It varies with different tissues. But I can tell you that an RBE of 1.1 is used for proton treatment plants. So basically, if I wanted to give 1.1 gray of photon radiation, I would only give one gray of proton radiation. So that's a back, so that 1.1, that RBE of 1.1, that's a back of the end of calculation. It varies, again, it varies with biologic tissue, at least a little bit. It also varies where you're at physically within the proton beam. Now we'll get to that in the next slide, set of slides. So this is a depth dose characteristic chart. Um, the y-axis is the relative dose, and the x-axis is depth in tissue or in water equivalent. So these are three different beams: uh, two energy, two different energies of electrons, and one uh, photon or X-ray beam. This is just to get at the different beam characteristics of each. So as British oncologists, we think about it. I know you guys, as physicists, you're thinking about something different. But for me, what I'm thinking about when I am playing and utilizing a form of radiation is what are its depth dose characteristics? So take, for example, electrons. Electrons, this is, we use the 60 MeV as an example. Uh, they start off kind of high in regards to their relative dose. So say the relative, say the absolute dose is 50 or 100, I'm sorry, 100. Well, here, the entrance dose, meaning the dose, when I shoot it at your skin, the dose that your skin is going to see from one fixed energy electron beam is about 80 um, units, whatever you grab, which is way too hot. Um, it quickly goes up to the prescribed dose, whatever that prescribed dose is, at about 2 millimeters, or excuse, sorry, 20 millimeters, 2 cm. And then it dramatically falls off relatively quickly. Now, you can see how that might be advantageous. Let's say I've got something, I've got a lymph node in my neck that has cancer, but I'm not sure. And let's say that right beneath that lymph node, not so terribly far away, is a big blood vessel. Well, you can see how it's probably advantageous to use electrons in that situation because you can get, quickly, get a very high dose to the tumor that you want to get it to, 
And then as you get deeper in the tissue where that blood vessel is, the dose drops off to close to nothing. However, you can see it being disadvantageous. Let's say I've got a tumor in the middle of my gut, and I've got a big gut, so I'm jumping out. But right in the middle of my gut, to get electrons to that depth, I would have to use a very, very high energy beam. So what would that do? That would create all kinds of skin dose, all kinds of dose that I do not want to give to areas that were superficial to the tumor that I wanted to treat. So this is what I'm talking about with using the physical characteristics of a particular bean to get the outcome that we want to get. Um, and then this is 6 MEV uh, x-rays, which again, um, peak early, but still have a lot of radiation. I mean, this is, you know, 20 CMs deep, right? So if I want to get at something deep, and the more, uh, the higher energy x-ray, the deeper basically this curve will shift to the right. So if I have something really deep, I want to use, I use 18 MEV electron, or 18 MEV uh, we typically don't use anything beyond that energy. The reason being is that the neutron scatter dramatically goes up. And there is some data to suggest that the higher rates of neutron scatter are associated with higher rates of secondary neutron. So typically, 18 is our limit. So talking about the more exotic beam energies, um, I'm going to not talk too much about neutrons because no one really uses them anymore anyway. But I want to talk about protons. So this is what we call the spread out Bragg peak. So what is the bright peak? I mean, I don't want to tell you guys something you certainly already know. But the bright peak for electrons is basically, or excuse me, for protons, is basically the end point of the B, the B minute of whatever you're utilizing. So fundamentally, the Ashuda down has a low increase dose in the tumor or in the body. It goes, 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 goes. It hits a predetermined point based on the energy that you put in it. It's fine. That's the bright peak, right? Now, the area of the Bragg tooth is actually very narrow, as you almost certainly know. It's very narrow. Not really helpful for treating a tumor because it's so small. So what do you do? You mix in a lot of different energies of protons to fundamentally create a spread out Bragg tooth that actually gives you an area that you can treat with radiation. Now, you can see how protons are advantageous, right? You get the end, you hit your back tooth, and then boom, the radiation doesn't go any further. It stops. That's what we tell patients to stop. Um, but there's two kind of cases as well. Number one, when you hit that front peak, remember we were talking about the RBE, right? And I said the back of the envelope calculation? That's what I was talking about. Because fundamentally, the RBE in the Bragg peak is a little wonky. Depending on the tumor t or the tissue that you're actually in, that RBE may not be completely accurate. It's something that we use, we use clinically, and it seems to work reasonably well clinically, but at the level of that Bragg peak, particularly at the very end of that Bragg peak, the RBE may be higher. So that's one. Two, protons are extraordinarily, exquisitely sensitive to the density of the tissue you're shooting at, right? And that can be a challenge, because you think about it. Let's say I'm going to treat a head and neck cancer. Well, what's up here? Well, yeah, there's skin, there's bone, there's soft tissue, there's air. So you can imagine that every time a proton beam hits a different interface, it affects its absorbance, or it's absorbed differently. Protons are not sensitive, not really sensitive to that. Not, not in a clinically relevant way. Protons, protons are very sensitive. So the model that we have to do for protons is actually far more intense than it is for photon radiation. And it's complex. So, protons have a number of advantages, but a number of disadvantages as well. It's just something to bear in mind. So, I've been talking a lot about beam characteristics and what we do and external beam radiation and radium and you know, people treat tuberculosis with radiation, but what do we actually do in the modern era? So I wanted to show you some examples of what things look like. So, this is an intensity modulated IMRT, intensity modulated radiation treatment plan. Remember I said we do CAT scans, right? So this is a slice of a CAT scan in the head and neck. This is, oops, this is front, back, left, right, okay? This is your jawbone, or a jawbone. The tumor is this little green thing that I've drawn. Remember Microsoft Paint? So I drew the tumor in green. Actually, here's the tumor and here's a lymph node that had cancer in it. 
So what we do is we draw it. That's the tumor. The area that is in the area that's filled in in red is the area I want to treat with my highest dose of radiation. The yellow is the lowest dose of radiation that I want to treat. The blue is the intermediate dose of radiation that I want to treat. So we've got that part. Now you see these lines, the red line, the blue line, the yellow line? Those are what we call the isodose lines. That's like a topographic map. You ever seen a topographic map? All right, good. Everybody's awake. We've seen a topographic map. All right. This is just like a topographic map, but for radiation dose. So the closer you are to the tumor, the higher the dose. The further you get away, the lower the dose. So the red line, the red line is 66 gray. Well, I'm sorry, 6,600 centigrade or 66 gray, depending upon how you like to report it. Um, the yellow is 54 or 5,400 centigrade. And then we get further out, like this tan is 10, and it's not listed here, but you see this green line, that's uh, 500 centigrade. A very low dose, but it's going to a very large area, right? Okay? Because we're spreading it out. So that's IMRT. And that's what we do. On the upper left-hand column, or excuse me, in the, the left-hand column, 3D conformal radiation. This is an older form of radiation that still has some value. For this type of radiation, we're not using multiple different beams coming from multiple different angles. We're using one or two radiation beams. In this case, we're using one that's coming from the front and a lower, uh, me, a lower intensity one that's coming from the back. Um, so it's much more simple, much less complicated than IMRT. And IMRT, we're actually using many different beams. Seven, eight, and in fact, we have an even newer form of radiation called volumetric arc therapy, which is basically you're laying there, and remember that arm that I showed you, slowly rotates around your body, delivering radiation the entire time in an arc. And with every degree in that arc, the intensity of the beam is slightly modulated. And that even delivers more conformality. Conformality, there's another term. What the heck is that? Conformality is basically the high dose getting high dose and staying very nicely close to the area that you want it to. It conforms itself. So the high dose conforms itself to the area you want it to go to. The intermediate dose conforms itself to the area you want it to go to and doesn't go elsewhere. That's conformality, at least from a radiation oncologist's perspective. So 3D conformal radiation, um, it is used in some scenarios. We particularly like it here because utilizing a very simple technique, I can spare this, which is, what is, what do we got? Larynx, huzzah, strong arc, all right, the larynx. We can spare the larynx radiation much better utilizing this technique because it's just a beam coming from the front with a larynx block and a beam coming from the back with a larynx block. So what does that mean? You're not getting all this scatter. You see this grain line, you see this uh, 10 gray line, this 40, I'm sorry, this is 40 gray, this is 30 gray. You see those scatters? You don't get that with 3D conformal. Because you don't have all those different beams coming in at different angles. You've got one coming from the front, one coming from the back. So there's still uses for it. So electrons. When do we use electrons? When we tell you about the neck, right? Well, look at this. In this scenario, here's the spinal cord. We want to stay off the spinal cord, right? So, but this is the area that we want to treat. So how are we going to do that? A single, uh, what, energy was that? Probably 9 MeV. A single 9 MeV appositional field shot right at the area that we want to treat. Because of those depth dose characteristics, it's going to stop. It doesn't penetrate very deeply, but it's going to stop. And that's very advantageous here, because I believe that this patient had previously had radiation, so you really want to stay off that spinal cord. Okay? So this is a scenario where we're utilizing this, the dosimetric advantages of the electron beam. Protons. Everybody, I'm sure, well, I'm pretty sure, if it had been flown in the hobby airport, flown in the hobby, have you seen the big sign, the, the big MD Anderson sign with the, with the cancer line through it? Some of them are very stern talking about protons, maybe? All right. So, <coughs> protons, and this is a very simple form of proton plan. Protons utilizing just two beams, um, stop. So what does that mean? That means that you don't have any radiation back here. You don't have any radiation up here. They stop. And that can be advantageous. But again, remember, you have to take into account, now this is a simpler plan, but you have to take into account, for example, here's lung, here's soft tissue, here's soft tissue again, here's bone. You have to have a planning software that takes into account the transition 
from soft tissue to bone to air back to soft tissue again. So with a few of these, you can handle that pretty straightforward. So let's say you've got lots of, remember the IMRT is lots of these coming in. Let's say you do that with protons. The difficulty for planning that increases exponentially the more beams that you're using. So you have to be cognizant of that. So I'm not going to talk about carbon ion, and we just don't know them enough. And, and honestly, no one, no one really knows, no one even knows what the argument is for carbon ion. So we're going to skip that. But I am going to talk about another methodology for delivering radiation. And this is called shared radiation. This is a newer form of radiation. So the, we were talking about fractionation previously, remember that, fractionation, lower doses, protracted time course. Many small doses aligned to normal tissue to repair itself and tumor tissue not. That was conventionally fractionated. Serotactic variation just takes all that protein stuff. <coughs> is that in certain scenarios, small tumors, easily visualized, far away from things that you can hurt with radiation, can actually be treated to very high doses of radiation in a short period of time. So as opposed to taking advantage of this DNA repair thing between normal tissue and tumor tissue, you're saying, bump it. Everything that I shoot my high dose at is going to die. I can do it because I'm just treating a very small area, and I use lung as an example. You've got two lungs. In many cases, you've got healthy lungs or they can be redundant. And you can take out a portion, several portions of lung, and still be okay. That's one area where we do stereotactic radiation. Another is the brain, interestingly enough. In the brain, you have lots of brain. And actually, you really do. You've got lots of brain. All of us. I mean, here, see, so you know, But if you're treating a very small area of the brain that's not in a critical location, you can actually ablate that. You can see it to an extraordinary high risk. And as long as you're careful about it, have a high degree of conformality, which we know what that is now, you have a high degree of conformality, can be said. This is stereotactic radiotherapy or stereotactic radiosurgery. And there's a lot of different names for it. SBRT. The newer one is Saber. And who doesn't want Saber? Saber's cool, right? Saber's a sword. Um, gamma knife or cyber knife, both of which are just, both of which are proprietary. I wish I could put an R there because they're both machine. Um, gamma knife is actually have a cobalt source. And if you ever see it, um, patients you know, used to treat brain tumors, or brain, uh, uh, cancer sort of went to the brain tumor. You'll actually see patients that have what amounts to a frame on their head that has been screwed into their skull. That frame holds an extraordinary still, which you can imagine. They are then laid on the back, and the frame is inserted into what amounts to a big metal metallic helmet. Now the metallic helmet, as a cobalt source that goes around, and depending upon the different beam angles that you want, will rest at a particular time in a particular area where the shielding opens for a particular time and then closes. And the cobalt source moves in the same thing happens. And ultimately, the different beams that come in intersect at the area you want it to treat. Is the itself or most of it is something, a large part of it, software control? That, yeah. You make well, and so what happens is the physician inputs basically the Microsoft team, right? Um, for Ganonite especially, um, you, do, you can do your own thing. You can do your own thing. Um, you can drop shots is what they call it. <coughs> okay. I'm going to drop a shot here, right around the tumor, here, right around the tumor, here, right around the tumor, here, right around the tumor. But that is translated by the computer into where the cobalt source is going. Uh, for IMRT, it's even more computer control. Fundamentally, the, you tell the computer, okay, I want to treat this area, I want to avoid this area, and then you actually put, uh, you weight all of that. So let's say I really don't want to treat the spinal cord. I'll weigh that at 100%. And I really want to make sure I treat all the tumor. I'll weigh that at 95% or something. So you weigh all of these characteristics, you give them particular weights, and then the computer will try to give you a solution that, that looks best. The, the computer software will give you a solution that, that looks best based upon what you have weighted and the input that you put in. Um, protons are a little bit more complicated because you also have the beam itself, the characteristics of the beam itself to, to model. Uh, 
and there's a lot of Monte Carlo simulations that go involved in that, and um, certain things are, <laughs> are above my pay grade. Um, but you're right, a lot of it is software driven. Um, so typically, this type of radiation, the stereotactic radiation, is delivered over the course of one to five days. And in fact, if you go beyond, now we do beyond five days in some, in some instances, um, you can't build that as stereotactic if you're building something else, which is weird, but whatever. Um, but typically, one to five days. Small tumors, lung, sometimes liver, um, brain. You've got to be far away from things that you're going to hurt. That's what we do. And I'm going to show you an example of it right now. So this is SBR2 to the lung. So this is a CAT scan, a CT scan, which you've seen before. And this is a small tumor in the lung. These are blood vessels. This is a lung parenchyma. And this is a tumor. This orange glow here is a PET scan. Well, I'm sorry, this whole scan here is a PET scan, but the orange glow represents tumor. What is a PET scan? A PET scan utilizes um, radio label glucose. Radio with glucose that can be imaged utilizing po uh, positron emission technology. Um, long story short, things that use glucose. Glucose is used by a lot of stuff in the body. Brain uses it, heart uses it, um, those are two biggies. Other organs in the body use it a little bit. Gets collected in the kidneys, gets peed out, hangs out in the blood and gets peed out. Um, tumors also use glucose for energy. So you can use a PET scan. Look for this regular label glucose. Get into the brain, because the brain lights up with crystal shit in the head scan. Can't really do it in the heart, but there's not very many tumors to go to it. It works great in most other sites. To tell you where tumor is and where tumor is not. Um, so here we see a nice orange glow, a modest orange glow actually, in the area where the tumor is. Now remember those topographic maps. Well that's what this is. This is a topographic map. And you can see, and it's a little hard to see and I apologize, but this blue is the very high dose region. And you can see here, this is the aortic arch. The aortic arch is a big blood vessel. You do not want to mess with it. Uh, wow. In fact, the entire volume of the blood that gets pumped from the heart comes from the aortic goes in the aortic arch and goes out of the It goes in the aortic You do not want to mess with that. And you can see, with this high degree of conformality, like this is the high dose. The blue is the high dose. Green and red, or excuse me, green and tan are actually very low doses of radiation. We have such a high degree of conformality to the area that we want to treat. We're giving low enough doses to make big red aorta that we can ablate this tumor and ablate it safely. That's what SBRT is. But notice, like if this tumor were right here, I couldn't do that. This tumor were here, I couldn't do that. It's only the fact that this tumor is in a lung. You got a lot of redundant lung if your lungs are healthy that you can accomplish this and accomplish this right there. Brachytherapy. Um, brachytherapy is, as I said, utilizing a radioactive source either implanted within a body cavity or actually implanted within a tumor itself to treat a small, defined area to a high dose. Converse, so you can actually plug it into a tumor and take it out, plug it into a body cavity and take it out, but there are certain uh, excerpts that you can actually plug it into an organ and let it sit. Um, the final example for that is actually iodine. Um, Brachytherapy seems to process cancer. If anyone has ever had seeds, seed treatments for prostate cancer, that's what that is. It's usually iodine. It seems to actually affect it, the decay, the decay of half lives, and that treats the cancer. Um, but there are a variety of different radioactive sources that are used. I don't know, 25. Palladium is sometimes used for prostate cancer. Um, iridium is not left in, but it is used for high dose rate brachytherapy. Um, Lucinium is sometimes used for eye plaques for melanoma. Um, cesium is also used for high dose brachytherapy. Uh, so, brachytherapy is used when you've got a, a tumor that's close to some interface. Like, for example, in cervical cancer, cervical cancer brachytherapy is used because you can actually implant a radioactive source near where the cervix is and treat it to a high dose while minimizing the dose to the area surrounding the cervix. We used to hear things like certain gold bottles or something. Certain hmm. gold. Gold. Um, gold is not at present used as brachytherapy, um, but they are tend to use what we call producer markers. So let's say, for example, you've got some, an organ that moves. Let's say, for example, you've got a tumor in the lung that moves a lot. Okay. 
And let's say you don't have the ability to image that daily when you do this SBRT. That's a perfect example, actually. So let's say, because when I do SBRT, I do a CAT scan on the treatment every day utilizing the LINAC to do a clone MCT. But let's say you don't have that capability. You can implant a gold seed in the tumor itself. You can utilize the CAT scan that guides the needle, that shoves that into the tumor, and you drop the gold seed. The gold seed is visible in an x -ray. So now, you treat that area where that gold seed is, and you know you're going to treat your tumor. So then it's called a fiducial. And that's what gold, it's, at least in my experience, is primarily used for. Um, so this is a plain film of a, this is actually endometrial cancer treatment. No way. Yeah, this is endometrial cancer treatment. So what you can see is that a radioactive source has been implanted uh, within the vagina, and it delivers radiation into the endometrial lining. That's what this is, and that's what the X-ray shows. The X-ray is basically to show that you're in the right place, and the source is the middle part right here. This is where the source comes in. This is just area surrounding the source, and the rings are just to let you know you're in the right position on the plane film. But the source itself is right here. This is a prostate brachytherapy treatment, the same general principle. All these little tiny lines, these are all seeds. They're all radioactive iodine seeds. They are implanted into the prostate, around through the prostate, and they deliver the radiation over the course of an iodine half life, like 41 days, something like that. They deliver the radiation, and they are left in. They are not removed. Like this, this treatment, this is left for a period of defined time to deliver a particular dose based on the energy of the source uh, and the depth you want to treat to, and then is removed. But this remains. Okay, more concepts in radiation oncology. Gross tumor volume, GTV. That is the actual tumor delineated typically on a CAT scan. So the green thing, that's GTV. Clinical tumor volume, that's the red part. That's the area that you're concerned about microscopic spread of the tumor, so you want to treat all that area to a high dose. Planning target volume, that's an additional margin around you see how the red doesn't quite touch the red here? That represents the PTB. So basically, the best immobilization I can do for you. Let's say I make a mask, which I do for head neck patients. It, it looks like a netting. It's like caustic netting. It holds you like this. Okay? It holds you like this. Even with this holding you very, very tight, you can still go out of the Two, three millimeters. But because that's so important, we have to take that into account. And that's what the PTV is, the planning target volume, is to take into account the fudge factor, the, the shifty bits, the three millimeters or so that you can move. All right. So image guidance and radiation. We've come a long way. So initially we started out, remember, going back to the very early days, you had a skin cancer, you could see it. I'm going to draw. I should use marker of draw here. I'm going to treat it. Let me go. All right. That was the early initial image guidance. Then we moved to plain films, x-rays, is what we use. And it's still used for the vast majority of treatments. You take a film from the front and a film from the side. You make sure that the patient is in the same position now that they were when you did the original CAT scan, because you actually reconstruct the plain film based upon the original CAT scan. Every day, I go into my office, I sit down my computer, and there's this wonderful computer program that pulls up the data images from that day or yesterday to compare to their original images. And I look at it. So the mass, great. That patient's in the right position now. So that's saved me. Now we can even do a combing CT, which I alluded to earlier, which are basically low-resolution CAT scans. So this is the original CAT scan, and this is the CAT scan performed on that patient that day. Okay, I see. So we can align even to that for even more clarity in regards to where the patient is located. All right, therapeutic ratio. What is that? So, okay. So, we talked about the different ways you can treat a radiation. We talked about the different ways you can use to see what you're treating in radiation. So, now we're going to kind of get into biological modifiers of how radiation works. Um, so, what is the therapeutic ratio? And that's what we want to try to optimize. But what is it? So, therapeutic ratio is basically the difference between tumor control and normal tissue damage. And these are just graphs, just example graphs. But fundamentally, the, this, ax, this axis is response, and this axis is cumulative dose of radiation. 
And as you go up, in regards to cumulative dose, the tumor control goes up. But as you go up, you also have increased normal tissue toxicity. This is a good therapeutic ratio. Why is that? Because you get to the very tippy top, 100% control, there's almost no normal tissue damage. So this is a therapeutic ratio. This is a lousy therapeutic ratio. Why? Because you get to the very tippy top of tumor control, you're almost at the tippy top of normal tissue damage, which is problematic. You don't want that. The goal for us as radiation oncologists is to optimize the therapeutic ratio. How do we do that? We do that by all the methods just described. We do that by choosing the right type of radiation. We do it by creating conformal radiation treatment. We do it by utilizing image guidance to make sure, you remember that margin at CCD? Right now we use about 3 millimeters in head neck. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we used something like 7. So that even, and you say, ah, 4 millimeters, what is that? That's an enormous thing. That is the difference between someone being able to swallow and someone not being able to swallow. Okay. So it's an enormous deal. But we're also looking to do it biologically. So how do we improve the therapeutic ratio? Well, there's really two ways that you can do it. Number one, you decrease normal tissue toxic sensitivity to radiation, and that's radio protection. Number two, you increase tumor sensitivity to radiation, and that's radio sensitization. And that horrible part is there's only one FDA approved agent to do it. That's that. And we've been doing this for, well, I showed you, we've been doing this since the turn of the century. I'm sorry, the turn of last century. So, generally, when we do research in this, we think about the acute radiation syndrome. I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with the acute radiation syndrome, but you've got the hematopoietic, the gut, and the CNS. Those are the three acute radiation symptoms. And preclinically, when we look for radioprotective primarily, we focus on those organs. We focus on those organs because we have nice biomarkers of radiation sensitization for each. We also focus on the salivary glands, uh, primarily Primarily because, and this is a this is a whole different primarily from head neck cancer radiotherapy, but you really do want to protect those salivary glands for head neck, um, and it's just it's one of, it's an easy organ to study. That's the problem with <laughs> that's the problem with any preclinical model is that we're only studying the things that are relatively straightforward to study, right? So that's why we have so few preclinical models for this. But uh, and the mechanism of action for any radio protector can be tissue specific, but not necessarily. Um, say, for example, there are certain drugs like imifostin, what I'm going to talk about, which is E1, FDA approved radio protection, has been clinically used, is actually relatively highly concentrated in the salivary gland. So it's very good at preventing what we call xerostomia. What's xerostomia? It's doctor's speak for dry mouth. We use these silly words. I don't know why we use these silly words. Like, for example, epistaxis. You know what, anyone here know what epistaxis is? The nose bleed. So anytime you read a doctor's name that says epistaxis, oh, the blood the, the nose is bleeding. I don't understand why we use these silly words to, to, to talk about normal concepts or, or perspiration, or sweat, edema, swelling, erythema, it's red. You know, we use these hold over some Greek and Latin, which I don't think it's shit. Anyway, so this is just a uh, basic table of acute radiation syndrome. I'm not going to go into these great details, but basically, long story short, the most sensitive system to whole body, this is whole body radiation. This is different than radiation doctors we do to therapeutic radiation. This is whole body radiation. The most sensitive is the hematologic system. And that's what will come first um, in regards to whole body radiation. As you go up, um, and, and basically each plus sign just means it's more severe. Um, and this gives you a prognosis. Um, and once you get beyond 5.5 gray, whole body radiation, you know, doesn't, doesn't go very well. The most sensitive system is the hematologic, uh, followed by the gastrointestinal, that's the gut. So hematologic is blood. Hematologic are white blood cells, which are the immune cells, uh, red blood cells, which are the things that convey oxygen to the peripheral tissues. Gastrointestinal, that's your gut. That is the eat, and it goes into your gut. That's what that is. And neurologic, obviously, is brain and spinal cord. Um, and, yeah. So, what are our goals? Protect normal tissue, but not tumor. That's one of the most difficult things to bring the radio protection to the market, at least in regards to cancer therapy. In regards to radio protection for, um, for exposures due to nuclear war, for exposures due to rat tracks and something like that, that's a little bit different. You know, as concerned about protecting normal tumor. But most radio protectants, you have to worry about protecting tumor. Um, now, how do you get around that? Number one, higher concentration in normal tissue versus tumor. Number two, activated only or primarily in normal tissue. 
It's got to be tolerable with the patient because they're getting all kinds of this in their and all kinds of side effects. You don't want to add to that if you can possibly help it. Um, most of the things that we've looked at to date are, in one way or another, free radical scavengers. Why is that? And again, I hate to, I hate to simplify things too much. And for the record, I know it's more complicated than this, but from a straightforward model, basically you have direct and indirect effects due to radiation. You have direct effects ionizing radiation. You have direct effects on the DNA itself, leading to a single strand. Okay, DNA has two strands, right? It has two strands. Radiation, ionizing radiation exposure can lead to a single strand break or a double strand break. Double strand break is more toxic. Um, but approximately, and somebody did some preclinical stuff somewhere to quantitate this, and I, and I use the rabbit bunny ears because I think it's much more complicated than this, but for the sake of argument, 33%, exactly 33, not 32, not 34, but 33% of the effect are direct on the DNA, versus 56% are indirect effects in the water that surrounds the DNA. Fundamentally creating free radicals based on the breakdown of oxygen, and those free radicals are what is leading to the DNA damage. And fundamentally, if you're following DNA damage, you have cell death, inflammation, and bisomer effects, meaning that this tum tumor cell, as it's dying, secretes stuff that tells the surrounding cells, hey, crap, I'm dying, do something for me. That is the bystander effect. Um, the one FDA approved radioprotectant is amoxicillin. It's a vial free scavenger that is inactive until coming in contact with cell membrane. It's like cell, it's cell right? and it protects itself from the outside world by a lipid bond. It's basically fat lipids and then bile layer. So you wait, and outside of the And there's an enzyme that actually um, activates amoxicillin. So it's activated form at the level of the cell membrane. It accumulates normal tissues at greater concentrations of tumor, particularly in the salivary gland. And it's given IV or subcutaneously, but it must be given within 30 minutes of treatment. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So you can pre-treat a little bit, not much, or you can post-treat, but it's got to be within 30 minutes. And some clinical trials have shown better salivary function following radiation in the head and neck if you give them the phosphine. Decreased rectal and urinary irritation during radiation if you give them the phosphine. Possible decreased damage to the lung. Um, we don't use it in Why? Because it's horribly toxic. You give it to patients. You've got to give it to them every day. Think about this. You need 33 days of radiation. You're going to come in, and you're going to make sure it's 30 minutes in treatment. When you come in, you're going to be IV treatment, you're going to be IV treatment, you're going to be horribly nauseated. When you're already sick, it makes you horribly nauseated, it makes you want to go Nobody wants to do that. Furthermore, you actually are at risk for something called hypotension. The doctor speaks that it's very low blood pressure. Now think about this. You get, let's say, head neck patients. If you primarily have neck patients, head neck patients aren't drinking more blood. They're on use. That pushes their blood pressure low in the body. So it's chronically dehydrated. Add to that severe nausea vomiting. Add to that a drug that makes them hypotensive or low blood pressure anyway, and it's not a good combination. So, and the logistics of it are extraordinarily challenging. So it's really not used very much. Even though it's FDA approved, it's really not used very much in all of us in the clinic. So what else about it? That was the FDA approved drug. I just went through it, right? That's it. You need to hold me. There's a lot of stuff that's coming down the pipe in one capacity or another. Uh, GLP-2, keratinocyte growth factor, these are both things that stimulate the proliferation of cells in the crypts of the gut. So if it took your gut, my gut, I want to check my gut, but if I cut up your gut and look at it under the microscope, what I would see are these little, you know, the, the, the buckles have ridges, so you would see these ridges in the gut. And in the bottom of the ridges, are the crypt cells. They're skin cells, meaning that they can generate and they make all the cells make the lining of the gut. That's where they come from. So what these two compounds are sought to do is actually stimulate the production of these stem cells, stimulate the proliferation and production, so they can fix, they can replace those cells in the gut that are killed by radiation. Um, LPA, lipid phosphate, LPA, which is in, available in oral form, OTP, um, it's basically a free radical scavenger and it appears to be focused on the gut. Um, the last one, flagellin or CBLB502. This one's kind of interesting. And I put this up here just, just to remind me to talk about it. But So flagellin is actually a bacteria. It's a portion of a bacteria. So what they're using 
is using a portion of the bacteria or the other compound, which is synthetic version of the form of bacteria, that stimulates a particular receptor, PLR5, the PLR receptor 5, that actually causes inflammation and cell proliferation in the gut. The gut thinks, hey, we're being attacked by a particular bacteria, and it proliferates. And the nice side effect, nice side effect of that is that the clip cells proliferate and protect the gut from radiation. So those are interesting, interesting, uh, interesting concepts. Um, other things, GI protectants. Um, still going back to the GI system. As opposed to free radical scavengers, which I've discussed with you, another way to prevent damage is to decrease pancreatic enzyme secretion. So the pancreas is an organ generally here. Um, it secretes all different kinds of enzymes which help break down food and fat. Um, but if you go into hyperdrive, you can actually secrete far too many enzymes that can actually break down the gut. So these two drugs, which are uh, somatostatin analogs, basically, apriotide and pethiotide, are ways, fundamentally, they're ways to tell the pancreas to calm down, simmer down, simmer down. Unfortunately, our treat had this tried and was actually found to be <laughs> was negative in a clinical trial. So what they do, ah, we're going to try a different one. That one's not good. We're going to try this other one. And I'm sure it'll work much better. Likelihood of that being positive is not high. And then finally, and I thought this was kind of interesting, um, simvastatin and privastatin. Are, is anyone here familiar with those drugs? Okay. What, what, what are those? What is it? I don't know. A few months back, the doctors across the nation said, take more statin. There you go. Statin. So what are statins? You guys know what statins are. What are statins? The cholesterol meds, right? So what people have done is taken these cholesterol meds and they treated animals with them and lo and behold, it actually protects their gut from radiation. I don't think I see this. I have no freaking idea why. It protects the crypt cells, which seems to be a common, you know, if you're getting this as a common theme, that's very good protection of the gut, but it protects them. And no one knows why. Get protection from radiation? What's that? I'm going to cholesterol, but I got three. Oh, totally. Exactly. If, if, you know, if somebody shoots you in the gut with a high dose of radiation, you're golden. <laughs> but it gets even crazier. To me, that's crazy. All right. So we treat the brain. And portions are brain tumors that we have to treat. We treat the brain. And there's a lot of long term toxicity associated with that, short term and long term toxicity. So what are we doing here? Well, now this, these two drugs, even though there, the, there's one FDA approved radio protectant, right, that we don't use, these two drugs are Alzheimer's drugs. They're both different forms of Alzheimer's drugs. Uh, but basically, both of them, the way that the neurons, brain cells work, is you've got cell A and cell A. And basically, the signal has to get from cell A to cell A. How does it do? So cell A says, oh, this thing, I'm going to get to the other. I'm going to secrete a chemical. And there's a little sticky in the chemical. Which I can secrete the chemical. It touches cell B. It hits little receptors that line the surface of cell B. And there's one that simple bind cell B, tell cell B, hey, I need to propagate the signal from cell B. So, electric signal, cell A. Oh, okay, I'm going to release this to what they call neurotransmitters. Those are the chemical specs. Release it across the synapse, which is the distance between the two cells. Go to them, touch cell B. Touches the little the cover receptors, but basically the little gateway and cell B. And tell cell B, hey, cell A, that's the type. Continue to propagate that system. Okay. So what these drugs do, because you've got this chemical, right? It's kind of hanging out the center. You can't get rid of it, because it's just tough, just tiny cell B. How do we feel? How do we feel? How do we feel? You've got to get rid of that chemical if you don't want the signal to continue and continue and continue. So there are things that remove. The chemicals the These drugs inhibit that removal. So the signal is propagated longer. So in effect, if you have fewer neurons that are firing less of a fire, if you decrease the amount of firing that's happening with the neurons that remain, you can theoretically have an advantage. And that's what all kinds of disease is fundamental. You're losing these neurons. You're losing the intensity of the signal. That's what it's coming to. But anyway. Can I understand you say that this is a positive effect? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
are both using Alzheimer's. They are modest, they offer modest effects in regards to Alzheimer's. Um, there, there are better drugs that are on the horizon for Alzheimer's, I think, but these drugs are used, and that's what they're FDA approved for, is Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. But both of them have been used in actual clinical trials for patients receiving radiation in the brain and actually have improved cognitive function following radiation in the brain. This is kind of a game changer, quite frankly, for my CMS radiation oncology colleagues. Um, other things, vitamin E, everyone talks about vitamin E, vitamin E, oh, it's amazing, cure for what ails you. It is a wonderful antioxidant. And I show a little diagram here talking about basically vitamin E. Remember we talked about the free radicals, the indirect versus direct effects and the free radicals in the water? Vitamin E can actually remove those free radicals and stop the chain reaction of free radical generation. Because what happens is you've got free radicals. And it doesn't mean that it's been hidden out from And then there's just each one of them. More and more and more propagation of a free radical signaling complex. Vitamin E stops that. There's two different isoforms here listed here. Alpha tocopherol. Alpha tocopherol is the more common one. Gamma is thought to be a little bit more active, but it's much more rare. This other compound, JP4-039, uh, colleague in Pid is actually working on that. It's, it's an antioxidant, but it works in a slightly different manner in the sense that it actually works on RLS generation in the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It basically generates the energy for the entire cell. It's kind of interesting the way they can that will be very, very quick. But kind of interesting, you got your cell, right? You got your cell, and in the middle of the cell, you got your nucleus. And the nucleus is where the DNA is. But around the nucleus, you've got the mitochondria. So how does that start to evolve? If it got a cell, then maybe it had a nucleus, maybe it didn't, but it didn't have mitochondria, right? This is weird. So the cell ran into some bacteria. They engulfed some bacteria. The bacteria did not. They basically evolved within the cell to become mitochondria. So fundamentally, mitochondria are remnants of things that were evolved by cells way back in primeval times. So it's kind of cool. But anyway, so this drug actually affects or, or uh, uh, removes reactive oxygen species, or ROS, that are generated in the mitochondria. Okay, so take takeaways from radio protectors. There is one FDA approved radio protector. There is one that we routinely use, and that's the NANTI, and that's only for brain. Many agents have been investigated primarily due to their free radical scavenging properties. Free radical scavengers are great. They don't cure cancer. They don't prevent cancer, generally, that we know of. But they may be radio protectors. All right, so the other thing, the thing that I do, the thing that my lab is primarily focused on this, radio sensitization, um, that's what we do. What are the goals? So tumors, tumors are weird. Tumors are new, but not you. Tumors are growths, they're made of cells. they're growths that can't control themselves. They're <laughs> they went and got way too drunk at the party. They just can't control those cells. They rapidly divide. And typically when cells come into contact with other cells, there's signals exchanged between the two that say, hey, stop the body. Two still happen. They continue to divide. And that's why they get bigger, 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 bigger. They also have other signals that are activated that say, hey, we'll find another home. That's called metastasis. So if it's a primary tumor somewhere, and it goes somewhere else, that's called metastasis. So what I'm trying to do is to try to find targets that are unique to tumor that we can inhibit in combination with radiation to kill the tumor but not normal cells. Secondarily, identify what is making the tumor resistant to the type of therapy that we're giving, namely the radiation. And third, identify agents that add only minimal toxicity to radiation because, as you know, radiation is a toxic therapy in and of itself. Um, so what's the most common thing? Chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is invented on 1950. Now, how is it invented? The very thing is, he was throwing bacteria on this like, platinum plate, and for some reason he ran out electricity through the platinum plate, and he created this platinum compound to kill the bacteria. He said, ah, I wonder if it's a cancer cell. So he closed it on to a cancer cell and wanted to kill the bacteria. This is the most commonly used chemotherapy agent in all the solid tumors ever, was invented in that experiment. It's like the swimming experience, right? It's kind of filling, but with platinum. And that's the most common thing that we use. Like, this platinum is the workhorse <laughs> It's certainly the most common thing we use in combination with radiation. Um, but these are all old drugs. They're also, you know the reason why chemotherapies work? 
They're trading just when we talk about radiation. What is radiation? It is treat with a small dose. Normal tissue repairs to DNA. Tumor tissue repairs to the last We do that again and again and again. Chemotherapy actually has a few mechanisms of action. The fundamentally they're training on the fact that tumor cells respond or can replicate very quickly. So chemotherapy is hot things that affect fast, fast replicating cells have that not fast replicating cells have done. So when you get chemotherapy, what kind of side effects do you get? Well, you get side effects in places that have rapidly dividing cells, your blood, your gut. But anyway, so we add chemotherapy to radiation to improve the therapeutic ratio. Unfortunately, it's horribly toxic. So it does make the tumor respond better, but the toxicity is far worse. And it's not targeted to any particular tumor alteration. One FDA-approved radiation chemotizer, and that's called cetuximab in head and neck cancer. This is called a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. This is the percent overall survival. This is the months out from treatment. This line represents radiation treatment alone. This line represents radiation plus cetuximab. Radiation plus cetuximab did significantly better. This was an enormous deal when it was published back in 2004, a long time ago. And this, this drug, again, came out of MD Anderson, an investigator in the TNN who passed away a couple years back. Uh, one of my mentors actually came up with this drug. And, well, sorry, not came up with it. Came up with the concept of using it in combination with radiation. What is it? So tumor cells have, okay, again, membrane, look at the bottom. The lipid bilayer has all kinds of things on it. Don't think of a tumor cell as having like a smooth, wonderful, flat surface. It's got all these different projections. And all these different projections are called receptors. They're just like, remember this piece, remember we're talking about the two knobs? And the, the one that created the stuff, and they take the other one and tell the other one to do something? Tumor cells are the same way. They respond to outside stuff. Chemicals. Um, it's called the cytokine. Protons, as the name suggests, makes them grow. One of the most important is called epidermal or epithelial growth factor, EGF. And the little thing that binds to that EGF in the outside world is called the EGFR, the epidermal or epithelial growth factor receptor. What, is, what does cetuximab do? Cetuximab inhibits the binding of the thing that tells the receptor to do something with the receptor itself, effectively blocking that signal. Downside. So, if you combine chemotherapy with radiation, if you combine cetuximab with radiation, what if you combine chemotherapy with radiation and cetuximab? Nothing is improved. Chemotherapy plus radiation, chemotherapy plus radiation plus cetuximab, you can see those two curves are almost completely overlapped. So unfortunately, the one biologic sensitizer that we have does not improve outcomes utilizing current standard care, which is chemotherapy plus radiation. So it kind of puts us behind the ball. Moreover, there are other trials that are in the show here that shows it's not affecting other cancers. So not in lung cancer, not in esophageal cancer. So we're behind the eight ball. What would make for the most effective radiation in my opinion? Number one, minimally toxic, because this treatment is very toxic. Number two, easy to administer. We saw with amethostine, if you can't administer it easy, you're not going to give it. Number three, already in clinical use. If I invent a drug from the very beginning, on average, it takes me 15 years to go from invented drugs to clinical use. Long time. But what if, just like in the remember those Alzheimer's drugs? They were already after you approved for something else. Easily so if you can take an FDA approved drug and integrate it in for something else, boom, so much the better. And finally, inexpensive. Cancer drugs are enormously expensive. And quite frankly, we're going to go bankrupt as a country if we have to continue to pay what we're paying for for multiple different therapies including cancer. So, which brings me to that format. Um, my lab, I actually sort of say in that format, mine was a postdoc. Long time. Long time ago. Not that long, but long time ago. Um, basically, what had been found up to that point was that in, if you went back and looked at huge groups of patients, and looked at patients that were taking metformin for the diabetes therapy, metformin for diabetes drugs, with them, versus those that weren't, the rate of cancer in those people that were taking metformin was less than the rate of cancer in those that were not. Further, and some of this work that we did, if you look at cancer patients 
they're actually taking that form at the time they're diagnosed. In many instances, their survival is better than those patients not taking that form. I'll just show you a few examples. So this is data that we did. Um, so this is tumor response to radiation plus chemotherapy. Right? So non-diabetics, tumor responded about 18% of the time. Diabetics, and this is in rectal cancer, by the way. And diabetics taking that formin, 35%. And diabetics not taking that formin, less than 10%. Um, esophageal cancer. Non-diabetics responded about 20% of the time. Diabetics taking that formin, 35%. Diabetics not taking that formin, a dismal 5% of the time. Moreover, this was dose dependent. Metformin, no metformin, less than 1,500 milligrams a day, greater than 1,500 milligrams a day. So even a dose dependent phenomenon, suggesting that radiation response was improved in those patients that were taking metformin. Not as good as a clinical trial, but very interesting nonetheless. Other people have seen it in thyroid cancer, patients that were taking metformin here versus diabetics not taking metformin here. Slightly improved survival. Again, this is percent, well, that's actually proportion surviving versus months. And thyroid cancer does very well, by the way. So this is, this difference is significant even though it doesn't exactly look like it. We did work with laryngeal cancer, basically showing that those patients that were diabetic taking metformin did significantly better than those patients that were diabetic not taking metformin and had a trend towards improvement to non-diabetic patients. Again, this is proportion of patients surviving and this is time. And finally, in head and neck cancer treated with surgery followed by radiation after surgery, there were no local failures, meaning the cancer didn't come back in the head and neck in the very few patients who were taking that from during radiation. So a lot of what we call retrospective data, what does that mean? It means that I have a group of patients that were treated for cancer, or treated for something, and I went back and looked at them retrospectively to find what characteristics were associated with something, with better outcome, with more toxicity. But the retrospective data suggests, as well as epidemiologic data they didn't show, that metformin is associated with better outcomes and better response to cancer therapy. So why would that be? So metformin is a really dirty drug. You get it. If you have a reaction, it's going to be a complex one on metformin. Remember that the top portion of the cell, the portion of bacteria that is engulfed by the prokaryotic cell leading back in the body of So what metformin does is it triggers a key part of mitochondrial energy generating capacity. It decreases the amount of energy that can be generated for the cell and it affects the redox state. Remember the reactive oxygen species? It affects the redox state. Now, in normal cells, metformin appears to inhibit reactive oxygen species, which is great. I don't know if you've seen the lay press about metformin, but metformin is an anti-aging cure. It's wonderful. It's magical. It's great. But in cancer cells, in our group and others, we found it actually increases the reactive oxygen and if you look at her DNA damage, you could do worse than increasing the action of the exhaustion station. So, what would make for the most effective resistance test? Minimally toxic? Millions of people take that form. Easy to administer? It's by mouth. You just take a pill. Take it several times a day, but you take a pill. Already in clinical use since the 60s. Inexpensive. We have a clinical trial I'm going to tell you about in two seconds. The entire treatment force. I probably said it's TBS if I'm serious. $15 for the entire treatment course. So inexpensive. So this is data that we, our lab and a collaborator generated. Um, this is an, a, a human, or excuse me, a mouse head neck tumor model. So I took head, human tumor cells, I put them in a mouse that doesn't have an immune system. You inject it into the tongue to recapitulate a head and neck tumor. And then you treat and you measure. So the measurements are on this axis and the days following tumor injection are on this axis. This is your control tumor. This is an animal that was treated with metformin, multiple doses of metformin. This is an animal that was treated with two times three gray of radiation. And this is an animal that was treated with a combination of the two. This is survival data <coughs> in the same animals, showing that the metformin plus radiation, almost all of them survived up to day 30. Down here, this is a, so this is a head neck model. This is a lung model. This is a lung model and this is a lung model. Injected in the lungs, and then tumor volume was monitored. This is the y-axis, and this is time. And basically, the purple one is metformin plus radiation in both groups, which did better than any of the other treatment groups. So, 
interested. Bring us insight. So this led to a multi trial with myself and the same college of Jimmy Basically looking at monkeys. And the reason I say it's not if you start back to radiation, just like we talked about before, you use it. If it's larger, it involves the mechanisms. We treat with a combination of conventional toxin and radiation and chemotherapy. Okay? That's what we do. So this trial was taking 179, 179 patients internationally and saying, okay, point four. How can you get what we would normally give you? Chemotherapy plus radiation. The other half, Get chemotherapy plus radiation plus metformin. The trial completed accrual in December of 2016, and I'm still waiting on the results. So, fingers crossed. But just to show that trials of radio sensitizers do not have to be these horribly complex agents that are horribly expensive, that we might be able to do something simple to actually help people. Um, a large number of agents, you know, that was just my own plug for my own drug, but a lot of agents have been investigated with very limited success. One FDA approved patient, right? Either they're too toxic, because let's say you mess with the DNA damage repair, right? The inciting event is radiation causes either direct damage to DNA or indirect damage via free radicals. Okay, let's, let's inhibit the things that fix DNA. Great, that's going to kill tumor. Boy, it's not going to be good for normal tissue, though. Because how's the normal tissue going to look right? So either horribly toxic, or it's not effective in vivo. I can't tell you how many, paper, how many papers in the literature of drugs that looked great. You grow the cells in a dish and you plump on the drug and you treat with radiation. What? Kill them. But you actually put it in an animal or you put it in a preclinical model. It doesn't do anything. Or it does a little bit of something in the preclinical model. They get it to a clinical trial, a small clinical trial, that do. So I put up a quote here that I quite like. All models are wrong, but some are useful. All of the preclinical models that we have for cancer. So what do we have? We have cells growing in a plastic dish. That's great. I mean, we do it everywhere, right? But it's nowhere near the fashion of the The next step up are what's called uh, microspheres, or basically little tiny tumor balls that look like an organ, a little tumor organ, that sort of kind of recapitulate a little bit better what a tumor looks like than just cells growing flat in plastic. But still not, right? What's the next step? Well, now we're moving to animals, and typically we use mice. So what you can do right now, you can use an animal that doesn't have an immune system with human cancer cells, or you can use an animal that has an immune system but with mouse cancer cells. Or you can take a mouse, get rid of its immune system, actually using total-body radiation and another thing, implant it with a human immune system, and then implant it with, a human, with human cells. But that's still not all that accurate. Those are the models that we have. They're not great, but they're what we have. Almost all radiation sensitizers have been initially screened for and tested in vitro. Cells growing flat on plastic, and we know that doesn't work. What my group is doing is actually looking for in vivo screening. So how do we do that? So what we can do is we can take human cancer cells, <coughs> we can plunk in two to three hundred what are called SHRNAs. What are SHRNAs? SHRNA is a little strand of RNA that targets specific proteins in the cell. Okay? So we put in a boatload of them. We put them into the cancer cells. We put the cancer cells in the animals and we treat them with radiation. We let them go for a period of time and then we collect the tumors. Now each of those SHRNAs, each of those inhibitor, inhibitors, have a bar code. So I can pay an enormous amount of money because it costs an enormous amount of money to bank up the thing. But I can send them for sequencing, these barcodes, and I can see what specific inhibitors made the cells, made the tumors, more sensitive to radiation. And that's what we're working on right now. And just to give you a taste of it, we've done six types of human head and neck cancer, and we've identified several targets. And one of them is this uh, protein called, well, there are two very similar proteins called EP300 or uh, Krebb BP. It's mutated in the first one had neck cancer and it's associated with poor outcomes. And there are drugs in clinical trial that are, oh, they're already out there. Not close, well, well used as metformin, but they're currently already out there. Um, no, I don't worry about this. This is the important part. Actually, these two. This is an in vivo model, all right, 
where we inhibited this particular target. This is tumor volume in the animal, and this is days after injection. Red is we didn't do anything to it. Yellow is we treated with fractionated radiation, 9 times 2 gray, and it didn't do anything. Green is we inhibited this target that we identified. And blue is that we inhibited the target that we identified plus the fractionated radiation. And you can see a dramatic difference in reverse of tumor volume. And we stopped the experiments here because I wanted to get an actual picture just so I could show people. So these are tumors, control, control plus radiation, knockdown of the target of interest, knockdown of the target of interest plus RT. Pretty dramatic. We repeated the experiment. Bottom line, we cured. Blue is the knockdown of the target in two different ways, plus radiation, two gray times nine, which is far lower than what we use in human tumors to have an effect. And you can see that radiation by itself was in yellow. didn't do much. But you can see this dramatic effect of inhibiting our target interest. So I think this is a very nice validation of our methodology. Moreover, there is a strong out there that inhibits this. That's what's so exciting. But we might be able to make this work in real time and help real people. And this is survival data. We cured somewhere in the neighborhood of not quite half, but close to half of these tumors, using a dose that is one third what we would ordinarily use in people. And that's profound to me. Um, so, last but not least, and I'm going to just touch on the free food. So this, so that's one part. That's one part of research. And now we can find new things that tell me the tumor is more resistant to radiation. Um, one of the big things in oncology right now is immune therapy. I'm sure you've seen at least one commercial for Alpiva or something like that. You know, the, the happy smiling cancer patient that I got immune therapy and now everything is right with the world. Unfortunately, as much as we would like for that to be the case, it simply is not. But immunotherapy is the latest and greatest in, in oncology, utilizing the body's immune system, the body's own immune system, inhibiting certain aspects of it to attack the tumor more effectively. And this is a very complex diagram, but fundamentally, this is kind of the workhorse of the immune system, which is the CD8 positive T cell, and this is the tumor cell. The tumor cell has nice, lots of nice little tricks to tell the immune system, hey, we're fine, don't mess with us, to oppress it. What the current immune therapy drugs do is actually inhibit the signals that the tumor cell puts off to tell the immune cell, hey, we're fine, don't mess with us. So what we found is that in multiple groups of patients, a particular immune marker was associated with poor outcome following radiation. Bottom line, radiation is the immediate response necessary for radiation to work completely. That is to say, if you have something, one more tumor, that's repressing the immune system, radiation clinically will not work as well. And that's enormous. That's huge. I mean, the difference here between high and low expression, it's called PDL1, but fundamentally this immune repressive molecule. That absolute difference is somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 percent between those patients who had low expression and those patients who had high expression. This is, this is, did it come back? The y axis is, did the cancer come back? And if you had high expression of PDL1, you were 60 percent, 60 percent of those patients had the cancer come back versus someone in the neighborhood of 20 percent where they did not have this particular immune repressive molecule. So, can we target that molecule? Can we target that immune repressive molecule? Which is to say, if we treat this radiation, plus something that targets that immune repressive molecule, will we make it inside? Clinical trials aren't going to We won't know for a while. But, take a look. Number one, cytotoxic chemotherapy comes the backbone of radiosensitization. It's horribly toxic, but it's what we got. We got platinum from the 1950s, invented by some dude. It was a dude, I think. I think it was a dude. Some dude who was running electricity through platinum, created this platinum compound, it killed bacteria, it killed all the cancer cells too. That's what we got. There's one FDA approved biologically driven radiosensitizer, which is Cetuximab, which we only use in relatively isolated circumstances these days, because if you combine it with chemotherapy and radiation, it doesn't do anything else. I believe that in vivo screening may provide better results, and that is the primary focus of my lab, and harnessing the immune system may improve the efficacy of radiation. And this is my um, thank you for being patient with me. 
um, talking about a, a lot of different things. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. So, a lot of different ways to answer that question. I guess what I would say is that characterizing cancer cells has been helped by advanced technologies in multiple different ways. First, is advances in microscopy and in you know, uh, making tumors express different fluorescent proteins uh, has been quite helpful from a basic perspective, which is to say that I can take a particular protein and tag it with a fluorescent particle and visualize that in real time and use a few fluorescent um, But just like a lot of things, it's at the basic level we've seen the most advantages. Um, I'm going to put my clinician hat on here for a second. I will say that one of the big, the big journals in biologic science are cancer or cell science nature, right? And in cancer, it's cancer cell. Uh, the thing that I was going to say is that the things that help me clinically are not published in any history. They're published in journals that are a few and best factors. Things like clinical cancer. <laughs> Those are the things that are more imminently translatable to clinical, to my clinical world. Um, so I, yeah. So, but I think that it takes time for novel technologies to filter down to the clinical sphere. Um, and by that time, the most high-profile people can come and do something. But uh, I think it's kind of a circuitous answer to your question. Um, when you were talking about the radio protectants mm -hmm. in order to you know, uh, reduce the uh, reactive species like uh, free radicals, right. um, is, is there a possible method to, uh, I mean, it, sorry, is usually H2O is the free radical generator, right? right. Yeah. So are there other There are other others as well. Okay, so there are other so is there um, a way to... Nitrous compounds. Okay, gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so, are there is it possible to out methods to increase the generation of those free radicals as well, other than just uh, other than just oxygen? Yeah, yeah just no, I don't know. Um, so the majority of the drugs that are so the radio protectants are the ones that reduce the, the reactive oxygen species. Um, but that last kind of that JP compound that actually reduces nitrogen contain, containing uh, radicals. Uh, in regards to the converse, increasing them. Um, the majority of the studies looking at increasing free radical generation aren't, don't get to that level of specificity. They basically just use a gross output of free radicals, not specifically looking at oxygen containing versus nitrogen uh, free radicals. Um, such they can't be done. Um, the methodology is certainly there, um, but to my knowledge, I've not seen specific compounds for radio synthesization that target reactive oxygen species versus nitrogen containing free radicals. Um, but I have seen that level of radio protectants primarily again in the JP Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
Right after the World War II, but because you are uh, radio protectors, the longer range of cut protectors. Which actually, I'm talking about the red. It was, I can't remember the number, but it's 71%. So, uh, just your, just your, is that, are we on the threshold of, of uh, going to the uh, radio protectors? Is, is that our own salvation? We're going to have a crew, you know, uh, not only uh, survive, but uh, by the time we get to Mars, uh, uh, be physically uh, able to carry out their. So I think that, I think more work, quite frankly, needs to be done. We are limited by the outputs of the industry. I think that. Total body radiation is causing things like simple and we don't know what the LED is. I mean, we can't figure out the protons, and that's a very clean thing. Right? So that's number one. Number two, the outputs that we use for radio detection are for radio detection are not that there's not an enemy. Gus, chemicalogic system, and to some degree uh uh incursion. And the only real mechanism that we have there would be a whole body, if you're going to get a whole body of fundamentally leaving something that interacts directly with the level of the It's going to have to be some form of highly, highly effective through that. That is concentrated, that is easily concentrated throughout all the cells in It can't just be, you know, it can't just be concentrated in specific cells. It's going to be concentrated throughout the body. And the third difficulty is how do you, the most effective way to test it. Because you can get, and, and I talk about numbers for compounds, you can get the protective for itself to get um, or the protect, you know. But how do you, how can you rule out every toxicity, or even the majority of toxicity that would occur with something that we've never really seen before, which is long term exposure to cosmic rays which have almost certainly have a high RBD. We don't even have, you don't certainly have a high RBD constant. So, I would say that where I, where I president the NASA, head of NASA, whatever that would be interested, um, we're in charge of a large sum of money. Um, I would push that towards the kind of experiments that I'm studying. And then identifying novel methodologies to, this, to look at biomarkers of areas where you're responsible for the issue. Large scale in vivo screens. Um, maybe not the methodology that I would describe, but something that's actually been in vivo as far as the future. Even with normal tissue protection, the vast majority of them are done in vitro, the screening from in vitro. Um, yeah, so that's what I would do. Uh, because you're right, I mean, you know that you know far more about the ability to, to shield the object, but you're going to need better drugs in, in my opinion. And you're going to need a fundamentally, in my opinion, a fundamentally different way of viewing a paradigm shift in the research that's being done. But I think that at the end of the day, it would be some very high level, multi tissue trophic free radical study for the data that you will have to have a constant plasma level of. Um, so maybe a constant infusion. For chemotherapy, they have a little infusion toxic. And it may very well want, because it's easy for PO, it's by mass. Let's say you've got a trough. So let's say during the trough of whatever drug that you're using, you experience a higher level of mineral toxic radiation. So you have a flow, right? It's something. Well, that could be G. I mean, that could be your behind, right there. So it's going to have to be a constant plasma level, constant cellular level of whatever drug that you're talking about. In my we were talking uh, before we uh, started that, uh, you know, I think you uh, want to be able to start with uh, the today is so tough, and the meeting, and members, prayers, etc. Uh, and I, I was wondering if maybe, let's say 200 years ago, was it as prevalent? in the human species as it is today. So cancer is a disease, I mean, I'm talking about epidemiologically, not individually. But cancer epidemiologically is a disease age. 
So if you think about what was the average lifespan in two weeks? Four weeks ago, right? What do people die of typically? People die typically of infectious disease, which is pre penicillin, um, pre antibiotics, pre vaccine. So the average age lifespan is much less. So because the average lifespan is so much less, cancer is far less back there. Um, I know people, in my case, I don't know about your guys' Facebook feeds, but mine occasionally will have the secret the doctors don't tell you about the cancer or you know, pollutants in the environment that are giving you cancer right now. And yes, can we do better environmentally? Yes, we could. But largely, it's a, I mean, if you think about the 1900s, the early 1900s, late 1800s, the people died of tuberculosis. tuberculosis. Remember, we treated everything in between because it was just as tuberculosis. People died and kids died of measles, mumps. Um, uh, older kids, people died of flu. I mean, the flu epidemic of the 20s killed millions more people, more people than World War I. So, in regards to the prevalence of cancer, it is in the now, but we have a population that ages far more. Um, but I will say that there are, like, for example, um, did anybody here watch the, uh, the HBO movie app, John Atlas? Anybody watch it? Yeah. They didn't know his daughter had breast cancer. Um, that's horrible. I and mean, there's a written uh, uh, memoir of the surgery that they did to actually treat it. And it was pretty barbaric at the time. And cancer surgery uh, was invented, well, modern cancer surgery uh, was invented by Ben Halstead. Um, Halstead was uh, a gentleman um, out of Baltimore, a Crazy, crazy. But, I mean, he invented these radical surgeries that cured some cancer patients because he heard of it at the time, early, early, uh, early this century. He heard of it at the time. He's the one that invented the radical mastectomy for breast cancer. He invented the complete thyroidectomy for thyroid. Um, also, with cocaine. So, he <laughs> was. He was. He was. He was. Around it. Um, and Hoff said the problem with him is that he actually created a template. You know, the, what's the template for a surgeon? The arrogant, gruff, Kind of jerking persona, right? That originated with Halstead. Like, that's the guy. If you want to blame somebody for the horrible stereotype of surgeons, Halstead. Halstead was the model for a, a generation of surgeons around that time who then, like a, like a virus, transmitted with that to their, their trainees, transmitted to their trainees, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, uh, amazing, amazingly aggressive technique, but awesome. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry, that was, that was kind of off kilter, but fundamentally, as you age, cancer is a disease um, So that's where that comes from. Can you talk about the oxygen level that uh, if it's deep into the tumor, it becomes radiation resistant? Yes, yeah, excellent. That's an excellent point. I did not bring up the four R's of uh, radiation oncology, one of which is reoxygenation. So, okay, tiny tumor, let's say it's two millimeters in size. Fundamentally, it does not need its own blood supply. However, as it gets larger, it's just like any organ. It needs oxygen. Where does oxygen come from in the body? It comes from the blood. So as the tumor gets larger, it needs its own blood supply. Now, tumors secrete stuff that cause blood vessels to be grown into the tumor, but they're happy blood vessels. So they're very nutrient. So what you have is you have, let's say you've got this massive tumor, it's got areas that are well perfused with blood and areas that are not well perfused with blood. There are hypoxic. Hypoxic cells have some very interesting characteristics. Um, they're far harder to kill. They're far harder to kill with radiation, they're far harder to kill with cancer. They're far more so. Um, why is that? There have been literally thousands of papers trying to figure out. And everybody thinks we've got the answer. And no one does. But hypoxic cells are far more resistant to radiation than are normal oxygen. Um, and there's, you know, hypoxic cells secrete a variety of different growth factors, for example, that can render them more resistant to radiation. Hypoxic cells don't grow, or quite frankly, they don't divide as fast, and that can make them more resistant to radiation. Um, but there are a lot of different, but you're right. So you don't actually, it's not even, and that's why I think in vivo studies are so important, because if you just got a plate of cells, you're just dealing with a plate of cells. But in vivo, you've got a tumor, it's a tumor bulk, it's a mass. You've got areas like oxygen, areas of normal oxygen. You've got areas where tumor blood vessels are growing, areas where they're not growing. So you've got the whole tumor bulk, the whole oxygenation state of the cell, the whole metabolic state of the cell, or the of the tumor, which is different and varies across different regions of the tumor spatially. 
So that's why I think that the big chunk of neural models are uh, more important, really, than the uh, the cell thermal But that's the question. No, it's good. No, you're, 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 is your center uh, looking at quantum dots for fixation and mapping? Uh, I'm sure someone has it. I, I'm not, but I believe that um, a colleague of mine does a lot of nanoparticle work, and I think that, that he is he's not doing that, but I think he's not doing that on the right. But I, my knowledge of that is extraordinarily limited. But, but, I, but I believe that that is really happening. Um, so, how do how do we protect from um, daily radiation? Like microwave. Yeah. Don't, don't worry about microwave. Don't worry about microwave. You, you are well protected in microwave. So, no, what I mean is they take a microwave and they change the parallel to your little office. Oh, I see what you're saying. The data, the data one, the data. That level of granularity in regards to the chirality and the other changes in the food, let's say, the microwaves. It's like the DNA, right? You have to well, I think the data on that of actually having a biologic effect um, for like the food that you're eating is pretty sketchy. Right? Um, now, in regards to a more global sense, what do you need to worry about from a radiation exposure perspective, right? Radon. Radon is, a, is an occupational exposure that, that happens. Um, there are radon detectors, particularly in high risk or high, high, well, high risk areas. There's really not really one of them. Um, but in honesty, there's actually an interesting hypothesis. And I have honestly said this. High dose radiation leads to cancer. High, long term, high dose radiation is to But there's an interesting hypothesis that long term, very low dose exposure radiation. Is actually somewhat protective in the sense that it keeps your DNA damage repair mechanisms operating at high functionality and helps. And this is a little bit anthropomorphizing, but almost works in Darwinian sense for your cells, helping remove those cells that are not quite as good um, um, at repairing DNA, helping get rid of them. Um, and it's not completely, it's not, it's not, hypothesis is not completely accepted, but I find it to be fascinating. Um, but another hypothesis, which I feel is more likely true, is that the radiation exposure um, that, that we've had um, on the Earth is far greater previously than what it was now, uh, secondary to changes in the composition answer. But those high levels of cosmic ray, high levels of cosmic ray radiation and, and uh, cosmic radiation exposure actually accelerated, far accelerated the mutation rates in animals on Earth which ultimately accelerated the development of um, home safety, the character, intellectual characteristics of home safety. I find that to be fascinating as well. Fundamentally, the bombardment of radiation actually could theoretically have led to, to our development of species. That's kind of cool. Um, but I wouldn't, honestly, I wouldn't worry um, because I don't have good data to worry about in that context. Um, as long as you are not uh, as long as you are not wa walking into a treatment machine, the British treatment machine that is currently the one, um, as long as you are not sitting inside a CAT scanner many, 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 many times, um, I would not necessarily worry about my occupational radiation exposure. Um, are there things in the environment that are slightly, um, that have some potential of increasing the rate of cancer? There are, but Everyone, so the lay press always talks about 20% increased risk or 30% increased risk, right? But if you look at the absolute increase, it goes from like 0.001 to 0.002. <laughs> and that's the best I got, 100% more, right? And then you get the news media headlines that it's dramatically increased risk of malaria, of cancer. And it's, and it's, it's true, it's a true headline, but what is it? It's actually relatively meaningful. So what I would advise you in regards to not getting cancer, this is my, these are my points for not getting cancer. Number one, don't smoke. Or if you do smoke, stop. Number two, try to eat a reasonably healthy balanced diet. I'm not talking about being, being I'm not talking about being crazy, but a reasonably healthy, well balanced diet. Do those two things. And I am horrible to talk about this because I am jumping. <laughs> but 
be less chubby than me. If you can be less chubby than me, you're doing a good job. Because those are the things that you can do to help control your risk. Okay. Fundamentally, don't smoke. You know that. Don't rub snuff. Don't chew tobacco. Don't chew beetle nuts. Try not to be chubby. Although it's tough, I know. Um, and try to be a reasonably well balanced. Do those things, and your risk of cancer, I mean, it's going to go up as you age, regardless, but you can't control that. But you can control those things. So I was ready to send my kids to dentist. Wait, what? Why? Why do they need so the, so the exposure that your kids are going to get with two sex rays, because that's, they're doing what's called a pen rash. It's basically doing x-rays in your kids. The exposure is extraordinarily minimal. And again, it's that, it's that relative risk. It's that percent increase. The risk of getting a secondary malignancy decades down the line may be... I, I wouldn't even say it's elevated because it's such a small amount of radiation. Now, if you were taking your kids and getting a CAT scan every month for a few years, then heck yeah, don't do that. <laughs> but the Panorex X-ray, the dosing is so limited in scope and so limited in an absolute amount, I wouldn't be worried. Um, but now, uh, when I said it's fixed radiation, that's what I'm used to it. It's a living fact. So, lower dosages actually have more uh, mutations than high dosage. High dosage kills it. That, that's true, but you're also thinking about exposure time. So, the amount of exposure time that you're having with a panoramic sex rate is extraordinarily limited. It really is. Trust your DNA damage repair machinery for such a short exposure time. And actually, if you go back, you get back that low dose exposure. So, again, it's not that the a small amount of low dose exposure can actually directly be Again, it's not a completely known hypothesis, but I think it's just as germane as worrying about long term patient risk this being sick. Because I have a four and a half year old and a 16 year old. I'm worried about the cost. So many things that I worry about. But I think that, and I'll give you a perfect example. So one of my kids, we drive home uh, from the mass, and one of my kids says, Hey, I saw the nursery. So he had, he had a broken nursery, and he told me that he was his mouth. So I was a doctor, and then I find it, really an extra. I have no qualms. Because the end, it's all about relative risk, and relative risk is very small. And for even now, I left. He did a whole thing called KUV, which is a belly fix. And I wasn't worried about it. So we're right in a minute. Can you ever guarantee that nothing bad is ever going to happen ever, ever, ever? No. But as someone who has seen kids, now this is that very exciting. Kids get cancer. They come in touch. It sucks a lot. And there are certain solid tumors of cancer that are incapably treated with radiation. Most of them involve the bush. Now, they are risk Developing that is extraordinarily high. In every area that's been irradiated, they do have a risk. I've seen kids that come in were irradiated when they were very young. They come in, what do they come in with? They come in with thyroid cancers. They come in with lung cancers. They come in with and a secondary, typically in mental illness, the brain cancers. Why? Because those are the areas that previously received radiation. Young women have breast cancers. So that is a real phenomenon. And that is something that I really that a lot of researchers are working on. Can we get rid of radiation? Because their rate of secondary is much higher than a 50 or 70 year old person. Just, it, it's only because of the nature of time. Like, what do you need to develop a secondary medicine? You need time. If I'm 70, 80 years old, I have less time than if I have a, you know, in your opinion. But you're right. There is some radiation exposure. So remember, if you can fly, you were from the your plump, blowing up from the six Well, then it shows radiation there, right? So, I would, again, for me, I'm an extraordinary, I personally am an extraordinarily neurotic parent, but I would tell you, in my opinion, I would, I would not worry about the family. Murder. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful <laughs> Uh, for the undergraduate students, if you haven't picked up your paper, and I want to
And also next week is spring break, so we're not going to talk next week. The next week is the uh, next talk is going to be two weeks from today. Uh, so uh, those, uh, that's going to be uh, Stephen Fitzgerald, who's coming from uh, Intuitive Machine. So we'll talk then. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I believe it. That's okay. Here's what the action was.